The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is the IBC Amina webinar. Today, we are talking all things French and France, and I'm delighted to be joined by uh, one of our IBC former board members, uh, Kasia Dougal. Kasia uh, is one of the most experienced and also one of the I think, well, probably best respected, but also more than that, she's got a, a fantastic uh, outlook on, on doing communications, great character, always fun to be around. It actually makes communications really, really enjoyable, which it should be. So it's lovely to have you here, Kasia. Thank you. Now, before... Thank you. Um, thank you very much, huh? Rather, <laughs> rather flattering um, introductory. Um, you so, welcome, Kasia. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah. I was just going to say very quickly, we are going to be having a Q&A after Kasia has gone through her deck. So you can send over your questions in a question box and I will put it to Kasia. So Kasia, now it's all over to you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so uh, I'm written over and above being here. communicator. Um, I have I'm very often asked to go into French people as uh, Anglo-Saxon, so it really is one of my favorite topics. Um, we just briefly move to the next slide. Thanks, Alex. Um, give a, a brief um, overview of um, development, the communication agencies, branding, visual identity and content creation, working principally but not exclusively for French clients and uh, certainly exclusively in English language. Um, but our topic today is, um, is really about how we as um, Anglo-Saxons, as the French like to call us, so anybody that comes from, I suppose, English mother tongue background, what are the opportunities and what are the challenges for us um, working in France. It's, it's a tough environment, but there are definitely some big opportunities and I think they're getting bigger. Um, the way I have um, organized uh, the webinar today, um, if we just move on um, to the next slide, Alex, um, is really about the history. I mean, as you know, Know if you want to understand the culture or a country in which you're in, then you know get out your his uh, of how to do that. The current market is is bringing us. So, moving on to slide four. Um, basically, the reason I start with history is that the past is always with us. And I love this quote from Stephen Clark, uh, infamous author of A Year in the Mail, who says that really the problem with the past is that it isn't in the past at all. It lives with us every day. So what I've done is of, of, of what I think is, has been important in French history. I'm not going to do a course here in French history. So just taking a few important moments and, and you know, uh, characters, I think, in the history that have um, come and explain some of the reasons why the French are the way they are and, and how we can navigate through that. So next slide. Um, I start with William Conqueror and 1066. Now, as you know, from the history books, basically William Conqueror goes over to the UK, uh, wins the Battle of Hastings against Harold. Now, why is this important? So already it's a thousand years ago. Um, and basically it begins there, a thousand years of squabbles really between France um, and the UK. Um, but it is also important for the language because actually 80% of the French language was infiltrated from French into English at this moment. Um, so basically, it relatively means that the English that we are all speaking around the world is actually 80% French. Um, and I think that it's a sort of um, important point to remember. And, and one of the reasons why speaking French is not always so difficult as you imagine, because basically you just take a French accent and, and use the word. And most of the time people understand. And the reason that they understand here in France is because, of course, of um, the fantastic work that William did back in 1066. Um, if we move forward to the next slide and 800 years forward um, to the French Revolution, um, this is really a fundamental part for me in, in French history because it basically means, and many people say this, that um, the French are very much a nation of um, 
revolution rather than of evolution. And I think that that means that whilst the French are happy to fight for their rights and they'll they willingly go down into the streets, as you know, and strike, and I think that's in some ways a good part of them, it also means that making small incremental changes, perhaps the way that other neighboring countries do, is difficult for them because um, they were in a situation basically in 1789 um, where they had to fight so hard um, to bring change about. So I think that, that has become their entire character in a way. Um, and so, you know, change is difficult, as you you may have um, perceived if you're working in France. Finally, arrives when French have their back against the wall. There are some exceptions to this, and I think that the latest election of Macron is one where um, where finally, you know, the French people they, they went about it in a non-revolutionary fashion. Um, but I also think that the French Republic trust in leaders, uh, particularly the boss, and I think that sometimes the boss can sometimes be viewed as the enemy and not part of the group, um, but somebody who is superior and possibly against the greater good of the group. Um, and I, I think you will really feel that if you're negotiating with um, trade unions, for example, the difficulty of, of having a constructive conversation sometimes with them, uh, with you know those organizations who represent the salaried um, employees. And I, and I personally feel that, that it comes from the revolution and this sort of idea that they have to fight uh, very, very hard rather than negotiate softly to get um, what they want. Um, moving on a little bit, but almost in the in the same period of time, if we go on to the next slide, um, I've written here Napoleon and the Grand École because at the end of the 18th century, um, Napoleon creates a series of engineering schools where elite students are paid to attend. So I'm thinking about you know, Polytechnique Centrale. Um, Ecole Normale Sup, for those of you who know, um, and I think there are two main consequences to this. But basically, it begins to create an elite society with a grand école mentality. And what I mean by that is that, um, uh, you know, people and students, they create a network and a job for life basically and really thanks to that network that, that they meet when they're 18 then they're never out of a job and, and, and they kind of stay amongst themselves and I think because it's so difficult to get into those schools um, competition is really high and in fact that whole environment um, teaches early on I think students to compete um, to the death of the other almost rather than to actually um, cooperate together and I think that very often uh, one feels that working here in France that you know it's very much a competitive individualistic society interestingly rather than one of cooperation and I believe that that comes out of this you know grande école. There's a second extremely important consequence of the creation of the grande école from my opinion which is that it in fact has created what I know as an engineering driven society. Now well, by, by that I mean that engineers are revered and, and, and indeed very successful. So if you look at companies like, you know, SNCF, Saint-Gobain, Bureau Veritas, Talis, um, and, and basically clients around the world are looking upon them to solve extremely complex engineering issues. Um, they're not really sales driven. And this is, I think, an issue for communicators um, because when you have, you know, companies, and I've worked at many of them that are engineering driven effectively for many, many years until relatively recently, the business just dropped. I mean, you know, the, the, you know clients came to them and they didn't need to go out and fight for business and, 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 and approach kind of sales and marketing uh, approach to the market. Um, it was really the royalty of the engineers and if you are working in a B2B engineering company right now what you will notice in France is that in fact those um, companies are very often giving all of the money to the engineers and they don't revere and they don't value um, really even what you know sales can bring them. Very often they don't even actually have sales targets. I've even seen that in some of the smaller companies. Like if you don't have any sales targets, you have nobody's putting pressure on the creation of marketing teams and nobody's saying, well, actually, in order for me to get those sales targets, then I need a series of communication tools and I need somebody to create an event for me and I need somebody to, um, you know, do a website and come out with a, you know, a whole suite and whole strategy of communications in order for me to meet my targets. And when you don't have that pressure, it makes it very, very difficult, I think, for marketing and communications to access decent budgets. 
and, and even actually have a place at the table um, and, and sit on the, the executive committee and, and, and make decisions. And I believe that a lot of that whole situation comes from the fact that it's an engineering-driven society created by Napoleon when he decided to create the Grand Ecole. Um, and that's really what I say to just move on to the next slide, really, in this um, very sweet <laughs> little um, kind of cartoon, really, where the marketing guy says to his engineer friend, I don't see why engineers get paid more than marketing. And he says maybe because engineers design and build every important part of modern civilization, and all you did was misrepresent it. My point is that you need both. You really don't, says the engineer. And I think that that encapsulates in one slide, really, very much um, this kind of engineering-driven um, society with one very, very big exception. Um, and that big exception, of course, is the luxury industry. And that's totally different. So if you, if you do look at companies like L'Oreal, um, LVMH, um, you know, and all that's, you know, Chanel and luxury, um, that's a totally different bottle, a kettle of fish. And I think that there, certainly, um, marketing communications is very much at the heart of the business. And um, the, the way that those, those practitioners are treated and the access to um, budgets are totally different. So, if I just move on now to the next slide on the Age of Enlightenment. This, of course, um, is really um, the birth of uh, liberty, egality, and fraternity. Um, and really, I think, is an important point in history because it places the government at the center of French society. And it seems to me that the population, even now, is still happy to pay um, high taxes but in doing so, it means that they're less at ease at giving money to charity themselves. That effectively, France has you know, kind of created a nanny state, in a way, versus entrepreneurial spirit. Now, things are beginning to change. Um, the current generation is very different. There's a startup culture. There's you know, Station F. Um, and, and I think that there is a huge push on entrepreneurial spirit. Um, nonetheless, you know, we're still sort of in between these two worlds, really, and I can give you examples of this kind of nanny state environment where you may have, um, certainly with the old members of the population, a reticence of employees to perhaps self-train um, or, or to start up their own company um, or even to work out their own retirement benefit. There still seems to me a very, a very heavy uh, reliance on the state, which is both good and bad. Um, but I think it's important... Um, to understand that notion, because uh, somebody said to me recently about how individualistic they felt that the French were, and in many, in many ways, I think it comes from the idea that they give to the state, and therefore, they then need to look after themselves, but not in a kind of cooperative fashion. Um, and, and there is a big difference, I think, with, I see with, you know, some of my um, American colleagues who are very cooperative, and they will help and they will give to charity and, and the whole of the society seems to be based around those ideas. And in France, I think that tends to be, um, interestingly, a very individualistic approach because the idea of giving and, and charity and so on, it for them is taken care of um, by the state. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, I wanted to speak um, briefly about an important um, person. Now, of course, I could have taken a number of very important characters. And interestingly, I decided to take um, Descartes. So Descartes is a 16th century philosopher. Um, and the reason I've taken him is because actually, contrary to what some of us may, may believe, you know, we, I think very often Anglo-Saxons believe that, um, you know, the Latin countries tend to be less orderly, um, and, and a little bit uh, disorganized. At the same time, Descartes really pushed the idea of having pragmatic ideas and the need to prove whatever you say and show with empirical evidence and doubting the existing. And I think that, um, I mean, the French are very philosophical, they're ready to challenge you, and in fact, they have an enormous need, I think, for reassurance. Um, and the reason I speak about this is that uh, you will have noticed if you've worked on big projects in France that there is a big need for French teams to speak a lot enormously from at the beginning of the project. And so they won't begin actually operationally the project for a long time because they sit there and they imagine all of the 
scenarios that can happen over, you know, throughout the project. Um, they don't wait until they get to the bridge to cross it. They try and imagine all of the scenarios beforehand. So where perhaps an American or British company will start, they'll chat at the beginning of the project and start one week later. Maybe the French will start one month later and the Italians two months later. So I would kind of encourage you really when, you're, when you are working in this environment, never to forget actually the need, their need for reinsurance. Um, and that they will doubt everything that much of what you say, and it comes from this wonderful 16th century philosopher Descartes. Um, final slide, if you could just move on to the next one about uh, World War II. Now, I've, I've put this in here really because um, Paris was occupied by the Germans um, during the Second World War. Um, the UK was not, for example, and I think that that's an important point to make at the time of Brexit. Um, really that the French and, and the Germans joined. I mean, they created Europe for political reasons that they never wanted to live that experience of, of a worldwide war again. Um, the British, uh, with Margaret Thatcher, joined in the 70s for economic reasons, and they've left for economic reasons. And I think it's important to remember the different political you know, background and history that, that is behind um, you know, the Brexit situation and I and I want to really speak about the opportunities that I think the Brexit will, will bring. Um, very recently I heard that the European Medicine Agency or Medical Agency left the UK for the Netherlands. That's just one small, small example um, of the fact that there may be opportunities certainly for Anglo-Saxons living in Europe um, because they will probably begin to have, there's a shift uh, from what I can begin to see, there's a shift in the way um, I think that the Europeans, the Continentals in general, will start to view the UK, um, that they will still need our skill set, but perhaps that there will be more opportunities for us uh, living here in continental Europe um, than necessarily, um, you know, French or other European companies um, going directly to London or to the UK for those um, that skill set. So it's still very early days, but I. Would really encourage you just to, to, to look at that situation unfold and see what the opportunity is in it for you because I, I feel that it will bring and really that's the only positive way we can look at that um, uh, situation. So moving on to section two if we could just uh, yeah change uh, slides. Um, quick tips really, um, cultural tips um, of you know how to navigate our way through so if we move on to the next slide, really, um, France is all about relationships. It's relationship versus transaction. People will do their job here because they trust you. They will do it because you have a relationship, you know, with that person. They, they will not do it because, you know, it's, it's in their job description. I mean, they may, but they may not. And I think that if you want to get good service with the teams that you're working with, with the agencies that you're contracting, with the freelancers, um, you know, that you're entrusting, that, that really you have to create a relationship first. Now, I mean, I even do this with my bank, my bank manager. I mean, when I have a new bank manager, I actually go in, I sit down with them, I meet them face to face because I know that if I phone them, they will do the job immediately because they know who I am. And that, that is, I think, the biggest piece of advice I could really give anybody working here um, that before you start working with somebody, then, you know, if you can meet them face to face, if you can create that relationship before you start doing business, that you will find the relationship is, is just so much smoother. I mean, maybe that's the same the world over, but it's certainly particularly um, important here um, in, in France, really. And I think it makes life, you know, richer. Uh, people are so important. So really spend that time building the trust and creating the desire for people to want to work for you. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, I have just put one here about building trust. You know, um, and I have no, I have not yet found a historical background to the reason why French generally um, don't trust somebody who they don't know. Um, and again, these are generalities, of course, there, you know, there are, um, uh, always so many different um, people on earth and everything I say can of course be counteracted and you can find wonderful people who trust you immediately, of course you can. But as a general rule, I think you have to be introduced, even sometimes at a party. I have noticed, uh, which I find a little bit heavy, but even at parties sometimes they, they, they wait for a third party to introduce them rather than introducing themselves. 
So my advice to you really is if you have a target and you want to reach that person or that company, um, you're better off asking your network and trying to find somebody who's going to introduce you because it will bring much greater weight to the final meeting that you have than if you do cold calling. I mean, that, that's the same anywhere in the world. It's particularly important in France. And I don't know where historically this lack of trust comes from, um, but you can certainly um, feel it. And so that really just, you know, re kind of uh, enforces my message that you have to build those relationships and create that trust in order for you to have good working relationships. Um, just if we move on to the next um, slide, really individualism um, versus the collective. And I, I, I spoke about that earlier on. Um, it is difficult sometimes. I think perhaps the, I hope that the younger generation were a little bit um, different and that, you know, that certainly with, you know, collective working practices and collective intelligence um, that will move closer to, um, you know, working together rather than competing against each other. So if we move on to, um, yeah, the next slide, which is about the art of um, negotiation. Um, in France, no does not mean no. Um, you, very often when you ask for something, somebody says, no, it's not possible. For me, that's just a door that's opening. I just say, okay, I need to understand why that person is saying no to me. Are they fearful? Is it not exactly what they can do? I mean, they, they love being seduced and, and they love you know, entering into interactions with people. So for me, I just see that as an opportunity to negotiate the conditions that I want. Um, somebody once said to me that very often they, they, they kind of took the Anglo-Saxon approach when they were in a shop and said, oh, can I, can I see your manager to somebody when they didn't get what they wanted and I think that just means that the person in front of you loses face. I would really encourage you to adopt a more charming, um, you know, seductive approach really and try to just find out, you know, um, what's, what's worrying that person and, and how you can get what you want. Um, it really is all about negotiation. So moving on to the next slide, it's also about um, savoir-être really. Um, we've got, the, you know, savoir-faire versus Savoir être, and I've taken these two um, photos, um, really, of Condelario and of Gail Montfort. Interestingly, because for me, they are two French sportsmen, both of whom were more concerned about how the audience um, who were watching them, uh, you know, reacted to their performances than actually um, winning either the match um, or the ice skating. Uh, competition, and I think that says it all, really. That whereas in in the US and and in the UK, it's it's perhaps all about doing and having you know ticking things off on a list and and being irreproachably productive. In France, it's all about savoir être, about knowing how to behave and act in certain circumstances. And somebody interestingly once said to me, you know, in the US. You are employed as an expert in your field. In France, you are part of a club, and you have to know the inner workings of the company and have strong relationships. So, um, yeah, just a, just a thought, really, about that maybe it isn't all about uh, you know achieving an enormous amount, but actually um, looking at how you behave and how you interact with you know team members. So, moving on to the next slide, quick word about you know communication style. And using your emotions to your advantage. So um, when I was planning this um, presentation, someone said to me, goodness, I, I do find the French very direct. Well, uh, in French um, society, showing emotion is authorized. <laughs> uh, so despite the fact that it is a language of diplomacy, um, there is a notion that one can argue in public and then um, forget about it and, and not get upset about it. They're not frightened to say what they think or to disagree in public, uh, to talk about even difficult topics um, like, you know, politics and, and, and even religion sometimes at dinner parties. Um, and because of that, I think that sometimes for the Anglo-Saxon community, uh, the French can be viewed as forthright and, and sometimes even aggressive. Um, and I think that we need to remember that if we are attacked or openly challenged in a meeting, it is in our interest to openly defend ourselves. You know, in the UK, particularly, if you show emotion, you have lost the battle. In France, if you don't show emotion, you have lost the battle. So, um, you know, fight for your rights and, and play them really at their, at their own game and, and, and have those, you know, um, honest, authorised, uh, those, those, you know, conversations. The, the only thing I will say is sometimes humour 
uh, can be seen as a lack of seriousness. So, um, you know, depending on who you are, are dealing with, um, they're not into laughing really hugely about themselves, whereas perhaps in the UK or even Germany, you can sort of crack a joke about yourself. Um, in, in France, it tends to be really all about um, their authority. Um, a quick, uh, if we move on to the next slide, um, a chat really about speaking in meetings. Um, and I, I've just written really, you have, you know, one and two. One is the first person and the second is the second person. So, of course, in English, generally in Australia and, and you know, in South Africa, etc., certainly one would wait for the person in front of you to finish their, what they're saying before beginning. And in France, actually, they don't do that. And my advice to you then is, in that case, don't, don't hesitate to interrupt the person who is in front of you, because otherwise they're just going to keep talking and talking, and they are um, not going to be, um, I mean, they're, they're waiting for you to interrupt them for the conversation to take place. So I think that's an important you know, thing to um, remember. Next slide, I've just done a, a brief one really about um, time management. Um, this, is English, I, this is interesting, I, I mentioned earlier on, um, that uh, you know that the I put English, but of course I, I mean really the whole of the Anglo-Saxon world and, and, and beyond, really, that the discussion and the planification part uh, will take a relatively short space of time and then we'll move immediately into production. In the French, you know, they, they need to be reassured so they're going to begin the project the, the project later. And and many of you may have been in these endless meetings that go on forever, sometimes where you know no minutes are taken and I mean you know you have to just sort of hang it out and, and, and accept that basically they're going to start the project later. Uh, normally they do deliver um, on time when things go um, well. Um, moving on to the next one which is related is a question about quality and I have noticed that French are very um, interested um, in buying good quality things and in one of the um, seminars that I led, um, some of the elder generation mentioned to me how difficult they find it to deal with what we call the minimum viable product concept. That the fact that you have Microsoft and Google that for now years have been launching products that are maybe 95% or 90% finished and that the 10% is just going to be finished thanks to the user input is something that they find difficult um, to deal with. That for them, um, they feel more at ease. And I'm, I'm speaking here of the slightly older generation, perhaps those who, you know, engineers who are in their 50s, that for them, they're not at ease releasing a project that they feel or a product that is not totally finished and complete. So worth moving on to the next slide about um, hierarchy. And this was again somebody who asked me um, my thoughts on this. Now, I think one has to put it in its context. And I've written here, it's not about performing, it's about lasting, which is a, a little bit brutal. But I have noticed that sometimes um, people stay uh, in jobs, of course, longer, much longer in France than they do elsewhere in the world. Um, and that you know, finding a job is is tough. The competition is is fierce because you know it's it's expensive to fire somebody basically, um, and and hence you see a lot of decisions that are made that are not necessarily in the best interest of the company, but they are trying to help that person stay as long as possible in that position. So sometimes decisions are you know are made uh, not for the best really of um, the company itself. I think the idea of flat hierarchies is new um, and, and whilst the younger generation are probably at ease with that, um, you know, some of some of the, the middle management are not always that comfortable with the responsibility that comes from decision making. So with the increase of collaborative working practices and workshops, um, you know, those hierarchies are getting flatter. Um, nonetheless, I often feel there is a hidden decision makers. Uh, and it's just difficult to find out who that hidden decision maker is. You know, sometimes it, it, they do do all of these workshops, and then in fact it's one person behind that decides, and you as a supplier, or, or even within the company, don't necessarily know who that person is and how those decisions are made. So um, my advice really, I suppose, is to try to identify as early as possible, if you can, who the real decision maker is, and find ways to lobby to that person. Very often outside consultants and agencies are brought in to say what the teams have already been saying, and they, they use the outside person to give it you know, extra impact. Um, 
So my advice really, I suppose, is to play the hierarchy rather than go against it. Um, some agencies ask for an organigram, and if you can get it, that's great. That will give you some idea. However, um, very often there is no organigram because it becomes too political to actually put the reporting and the pecking order on a piece of paper. Um, so the hierarchy, I think, is a difficult one, but it, it, it is important to remember that I think um, French and perhaps Latin societies in general do tend to be more hierarchical um, than perhaps some of the flatter ones that we would find in, in you know, the US or in the UK and uh, Australia. So um, moving on to the final and very briefly um, section, so the next slide really. Um, the question I suppose we, we ask ourselves then is what's the opportunity? Um, you know that there are there are challenges. It is it is quite um, tough sometimes. Um, and really, what I would say is that you know the USA, the UK, Australia, particularly, I mean, are leading the world in mark on practices. So all that's digital, certainly social media and employee engagement, um, comes out of those countries. And therein lies your opportunity, because you know for somebody particularly who maybe comes from the states then they're five, 10, possibly even 15 years down the line in the UK as well. So you can see what's coming and the French will respect you for that. And so, you know, rather than being, you know, finding it difficult to imagine what the next few years are going to bring, then basically you can come already with that knowledge. Um, and, you know, you don't have to predict, you're credible in the advice um, and the accompaniment that you bring the teams that you work with. So, Rather than being upset and finding it difficult that the French are recalcitrant regarding the digital uptake, um, I would say to you what you think may be your weakness is in fact probably your greatest um, asset. So, you know, your, your different culture, you know, the languages that you speak will, will set you apart from your French, French counterparts and will enable you to bring obviously a different set of skills and a different added value to the table. And if you play that card, I really think that um, you will bring huge added value and will set yourself apart. So I will um, hand it back to you, um, Alex, really. Um, I've got to the end of, you know, most of what I wanted to say and I'd really like to like kind of open up the floor to, to questions and, and really just ask what everyone else is um, here working here in France. Casio, thank you. I, I'm still taking all that in. Uh, history psychology, opportunity, all in one, uh, in 30 minutes, um, you really should be a speed presenter. Right, we are going to open up now to questions, so you can write your questions in the question box. Um, we already have had one question come in from Chris. Um, he'd be interested in hearing more about opportunities through Brexit. Now, we didn't mention much about Brexit. Kasia, what is happening with Brexit and its impact on opportunities for us communicators when it comes to France? Okay, well, um, I, for example, if you if you think about um, the banking industry, um, so already I have met some um, English London-based bankers who have moved um, to Paris. Those people uh, don't speak French, so they are definitely going to want to call upon communicators who a are English mother tongue, who are going to help them, you know, understand how they can bring added value from the UK. Um, and I think that you know people who are based here um, in in France will be the go between between the two cultures. So the fact that in a way, and I'm sad to say this because of course I am English, I, I think that the kudos really. Um, uh, of you know British culture particularly and Mark Holmes has taken a bit of a dent which means that um, we will start to look for providers who are European based um, and I think it's early days yet so for the moment we you know I gave the example of uh, the European medical agency but there will be other agencies and there will be other entities that leave the UK well then where are they going and who's going to serve those people because at the end of the day it's all about network so if you are physically in the countries that you know um, are the receivers of you know this business and of those entities then you know you will be able to sell your services in a way that would have been more difficult for you beforehand um, so I don't have a crystal ball but I, I, I'm going to be looking at that very closely to see how Marcom specialists can um, offer their services particularly Anglo-Saxons living here in France I, I hope that goes some way to answering the question Great, thank you, Chris, for the question. I'm going to ask a question from my side. 
Kasia, is it all about Paris or are there opportunities outside of Paris? Well, this is, this is a tough question. Um, it, is, it is very, very heavily based Paris. And the reason for that is it goes back to Napoleon. He created a very centralized society. So all of the power organs, all of the legislation, everything comes out of the center. So it's very difficult for anyone to have a big career, even if they're a lawyer uh, or even a kind of a top doctor with a specialist, at some point they will have to come to Paris. So there are definitely opportunities, I think, in, in other places, um, but it's harder and there are fewer of them. But the places I would mention are definitely possibly Strasbourg um, because of its proximity with um, Germany. And certainly um, not, uh, uh, which is picking up a lot of the French tech. Um, so those are two cities. And for those who are, you know, heavily pharmaceuticals, it will be Lyon. Okay, we have a question from Lillian. Um, she's asking specifically about how do translators fit into the communications team? Sorry, say that again. How do you what? How do translators fit into the communications team? Um, so I'm, I'm presuming that this is um, from French into English. I would presume so. Yes. It is. Okay. Well, I mean, the, I work with um, translators. I think it's it's becoming difficult because a lot of documents that were previously written in French and now directly written into English. Um, so I think that the market is is dropping. I think it's it's harder to find um, stuff. And I think that there's a push also on artificial intelligence. Um, so within the next kind of five to ten years, that market is going to be stretched. So a number of translators that I know in Paris actually have changed their offering and are now writers or offering their services in content creation because they can feel the pressure on that market dwindling. Okay, interesting. Thank you for that. Do we have any other questions? Um, so Alex has shared a question. Um, let's have a look and scroll up. He, so he says, thank you for your talk. Um, are you more inclined to always uh, Vuvoy or do you to toy with your French colleagues? Um, so do you, do you go formal or do you go informal? Okay, uh, again that depends on the environment in which you're in. When I first came to France 25 years ago then it, we were all in the Vuvoiement and now it's very very rare um, that I do not to toy. That having said, I think that if you have clients in the initial stages, it's important that you vouvoie and you let them move into the two. So if somebody tues you, then you tue them back. If they don't and they stay in the vous, then stay in the vous. That's my advice. And I think it really depends on the age of the person. I mean, if you're 25 and you're dealing with somebody who's 25, there's little chance you're going to be vouvoying them. But if you're 25 and your boss is 60, then I would, I would start with the vous and see how you go. Okay, we have a question from Robin. Um, she says, I understand entirely that people work with people they know, like and trust. So networking is key. Um, but her network is still small. So she needs to use content marketing to promote her services. Are French businesses, agencies searching the internet to find freelancers? So are they searching for native English content creation, for example? Absolutely. That market is growing. There's no doubt about it. So I was recently with um, somebody from a huge company, Sodexo, 18th um, world employer. Yeah? So they have 400,000 um, employees and there was pressure on the communications team to work with freelancers more and agencies less. So there is a definitely a push on working with freelancers, whatever the work, and B, there is definitely an increase um, in the market for English mother tongue, simply because um, most agencies' clients are working on a global market. 75%, I was reading this recently, 
of you know French companies do business abroad and very often you know 70% of their business comes from abroad which means that their clients are English speaking so they have to communicate in English and this is just an increasing trend the world is getting more global every single day so the um, requirements from communication agencies and from their clients to communicate in English is only going to increase Okay, we have two questions from Chris on this, um, which is actually a good follow on. Um, so in terms of suppliers, okay, they have to speak French, but do you have to speak fluent French or can you get by, for example, either with Pigeon or can you even get by just with English? And in terms of experience of demand for English, is do they prefer UK English or do they prefer US English? Okay, so um, on the first um, on the first question, it's I'll be very honest. I think it's still difficult to not speak any French at all because um, there's so much that you miss. So definitely, if you can, you know, get as involved in in French circles as possible and try to get your French as, as you know up up to scratch as quickly as you can because it will really help you. Um, I think you can get by with less French. I would hope so, of course, absolutely. However, again, you know, I think that you get respected more if you have good French. And I think that is key to, um, to some of what you do. However, I do know that the problem with speaking French, of course, or any languages, is that it waters down um, your level of English. And I do know that some companies, and L'Oreal is one of them, uh, and some of the bigger agencies, publicists, McCann, will only recruit um, English-speaking people who do not speak French, particularly for writing rules. So there, there is an opportunity. It, I think it all depends on you know where you're living and what you want to do and, and what role you have, um, and, and even maybe the industry that you're targeting. Certainly, I would imagine that the you know um, startup industry is really full of young people, French people, whose English is great. So um, perhaps you know look into the industries that you're targeting. And the uh, second part of the question, Alex, could you just remind me again? Well, what do the French prefer? Do they prefer UK English, which I would call proper English, um, being British, or do they uh, prefer US English? Again, I mean, that's, um, that really is 50-50, I think. Um, probably a while ago it was more UK, and perhaps now it's US, but again, it depends if you have a client that's only working in the US and they're trying to crack the US market, then obviously it's going to be US English, but I, um, depending on the skill set of the person who asked that question, uh, generally I would be inclined to offer both if you can. I do say that working in a US organization where I have to keep pushing back every day, but you know, we all find our own battles. Um, I think we are out of time. I think we are done with questions. It's been a really fun session. There's been lots of questions and lots of um, input in terms of what you've shared. Um, so um, actually there is one more question. Let me take this. So Robin has asked, uh, she basically says, uh, there is a platform that has good information about rates for consultants, freelancers called Malts. Is there somewhere specific that provides an, an idea of what rates are acceptable for comms professionals to charge here in France? Again, I think um, I think it is all about network. Um, finding out prices and, and how you're going to price it is the easiest thing to do is to ask people doing a similar thing as you. So I'd be happy, Robin, to, to talk to you at any time really to, to exchange about that. Um, coming back to Malt, um, Malt is relatively new. I know them, I, I met them several years ago. Um, so it's, it is a successful platform. The interesting thing to know though is that there are a number of platforms that put large companies in contact with freelancers. The way they are organized, however, does not make it easy for those end clients to find English mother tongue writers, because it's just not set up that way. Um, so for the moment, it still really is, I'm not saying you'll never get any work from them, uh, I, I wouldn't suggest that, but again, 
the person who I know who worked on Malt that's got the most amount of work actually knows them personally. So I, again, I still think that the network is is going to um, make a big difference. But again, of course, creating content and making those contacts via um, internet um, is 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 still valid. Um, but we'll see how we we'll have to look at those platforms and see how they evolve and whether they are, uh, you know, bringing new functionalities that enable it. To, to be easier for bigger companies to identify people like us. I love that. Even in the age of the online network, human network is still key, um, no, especially in France. Kasia, thank you so much uh, for this session. Um, I think we've all enjoyed it. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I just want to, to say thank you on behalf of IBC Amina uh, for your time, for your energy and your passion. Um, and thank you, everyone, to all the attendees. Um, it's been a lot of fun, as always. So thank you for this week. Kasia, again, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we will see you all soon for the next IBC Amina webinar. Till then, take care. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Really enjoyed it. Bye-bye.